stuff, boys and girls. Write down, pay attention, important work carries on here in the Meat Miller Show, where yet again we're dealing with people who want to be wrong on the interwebs. Today's victim is some frankly ridiculous buffoon woman who wants to tell us uh, that the carnivore diet may be harmful long term. So let's hear all about it uh, and we'll put it right where it's wrong and spoiler boys and girls. That's everywhere. Radio. Off you go. Vitamin C is really important for preventing things like scurvy. Yes, vitamin C is really important for preventing scurvy. Correct. Uh, point me to any single bona fide uh, confirmed case of scurvy in a person eating a carnivore diet for any period of time. We'll wait. We won't wait, actually, because I'll tell you exactly how many cases of confirmed scurvy have been reported in people who eat carnivore diets. Uh, none, none at all. And there are hundreds of thousands and probably millions of us doing this. I myself have been eating an almost entirely carnivorous diet now for over seven years. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Berry, over 10 years, I believe, on a nearly, if not entirely, carnivorous diet. Um, his wife, Mrs. Dr. Berry, a similar period of time. Dr. Sean Baker, a similar period of time. Dr. Jordan Peterson, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Michaela Peterson, or Ms. Michaela Peterson, whichever one it is, or even just no honorific, I don't know. Let's not assume anything. Um, Kelly Hogan, 12 years or so. Scurvy takes about six weeks to develop. Not 12 years. Mm. Clearly something's going on that this ridiculous woman doesn't know anything about. Maybe there is perfectly sufficient vitamin C for the needs of a human being on a carnivorous diet. Um, or not maybe, there is, because we're not all falling over dead from scurvy. None of us are, in fact, so wrong. That's just absolute nonsense before you even start. Goodness me, scurvy. Awesome. Um, mm, so the old, <laughs> the old illness that sailors used to get from not being able to eat any fresh fruit. By the way, when I want to get uh, advice on some aspect of something from somebody, um, I generally look at that person and I go, does that person appear to be someone who would be worth following their advice on a particular topic? Uh, in this case, health and nutrition. Uh, it's pretty clear straight away um, that this person is not someone who you'd, you'd probably want to follow, I would suggest. Where your gums start bleeding, old scars start opening up, you can't heal wounds properly, that's not a very pleasant way to live. Yeah, it's dreadful. Scurvy is a horrible disease, but uh, as you say, it just doesn't happen to people who eat a carnivorous diet uh, because we get plenty of vitamin C. It's like a zombie really film. Yeah, it, it, re it really eat all meat and, and get scurvy. Yeah, that yeah, no, that doesn't happen. Nonsense. Absolute garbage. This is on the ABC, a so-called respectable Australian network. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. This is absolutely fucking ridiculous on a number of counts, shall we say. It does sound like a zombie film. <laughs> What's so bad about an all-meat diet? Well, let's see. There are potential consequences in terms of eating too much meat. Are there? There are potential consequences to eating too much of anything. You would need to define, of course, how much is too much for any given individual according to their needs. And yes, too much of anything could be a problem. Too much water is a problem. Um, too much energetic intake without enough expenditure can be a real problem, can't it, Dr. Emma Beckett? For example, um, all sorts of things that you do too much of and not enough of other things can really be a problem 
Um, anyway, tell us all about health, though, and nutrition. Off you go. A Dr. Emma Bickett, molecular nutritionist who doesn't understand scurvy or doesn't know that people who eat a carnivorous diet do not experience it. Good. Good, good, good. I, people probably ought to write to the University of Newcastle and point out the um, level of ineptitude being displayed by one of its staff members in a very public forum here in Australia, and perhaps they might want to think about having a word with Dr. Emma Bickett about not making them look quite so foolish. Okay. Carry on, though. Emma, you're doing a great job, love. And if you're only eating meat, it's very likely you will be eating too much meat. Well, how much is that, though? How much is too much meat? So too much meat presents risks of things like... No? You're not going to tell us how much is too much. You're just going to go straight to risks, which, by the way, it doesn't matter what you're about to say. I know what you're going to say, of course, because it's the same ridiculous, nonsensical garbage espoused by many of you buffoons day in and day out, week in and week out, without little fucking hindrance. Let me be very, very clear on this before you even open your mouth any further on this, Emma. There is no experimental empirical evidence linking the consumption of meat or animal fat with any deleterious health outcome in human beings over any period of time whatsoever. Not one single empirical data point exists that can back any claim of risk. Risk is a cause and effect inference. You need an experimental, interventional, properly designed, properly powered metabolic ward lock-in, i.e. properly observed and controlled study over multiple decades. If you want to talk about the long-term health um, prospects of somebody eating any kind of diet whatsoever, none exists anywhere in the literature. But anyway, spout your ridiculous nonsense and I'll put it right where it's wrong, which will be everywhere. And I'll just say no, 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 because there is no evidence to support any of the claims I know you're about to make. Off you go, though. Too much saturated fat. Too much saturated fat. How much, how much saturated fat is too much? And saturated fat, by virtue of being saturated fat, does not present any health problem or concern Whatsoever, there are five major meta-analysis available on this topic, all with multi-million person years of follow-up. All of them agree. There's not even a statistically significant um, incidence difference in any aspect of mortality or any of the sub-causes of mortality whatsoever, let alone anything that's of any clinical utility. Uh, we're done with that. We're finished. Saturated fat is not a nutrient of concern by virtue of being saturated fat in human beings. Not whatsoever. Done. Can we move on? Um, saturated fat increases our risk of... No, it doesn't. Of anything. False. Bad cholesterol going... Bad cholesterol. Bad cholesterol. There is only one form of cholesterol. And it's not bad. You can't live without it. And in fact, 80% of the cholesterol in your body is manufactured by your body. According to the instructions encoded for that in your genes. It's entirely under the control of your genes. Those genes having survived both positive and negative selection pressures for 13.8 thousand million years at least okay the genes know what they're doing emma clearly does not scurvy though saturated fat though and now cholesterol absolutely destitute absolutely singularly without the first clue of what you're talking about emma at all bad cholesterol no Going high in our blood, which increases our risk of... No, it doesn't, of anything. 
No, risk is a cause and effect statement. Show me an experiment. Show me an adequately designed, adequately controlled, adequately powered, properly randomized metabolic ward lock in study on human beings over multiple decades. We won't wait because it does not exist. You liar. Heart disease and no. cardiovascular disease. No. And they're going to be very low in all of the other good things that come in our other foods. Our- like what? A meat only diet, meat and animal fat, does not lack any essential nutrients for humans whatsoever. None. Our vitamin C. Our- no, it's not short on vitamin C. As a carnivore, the intake requirements for vitamin C are vastly reduced with respect to someone eating a standard Western diet or a mixed macronutrient diet of any kind, actually. The transporter that's involved in getting vitamin C out of the blood and into the cells is called GLUT4. It's the same one that transports glucose across that membrane. And if that membrane is busy transporting a bunch of carbohydrate all the time, that carbohydrate outcompetes the vitamin C, thus meaning that you need a vastly higher concentration of vitamin C in your blood to get any into your cells if you eat any amount of carbohydrates. As a carnivore, you don't need anything like the amount of vitamin C. Uh, You just need a very, very small amount, and luckily that is to be found in meats. Okay, that's why we don't all fall over dead of scurvy. So that's the end of that ridiculous argument. We're done with it. What is next? Fiber, our vitamin K. Oh, fiber now. Fiber. Fiber is not an essential nutrient for human beings. It's not even a nutrient for human beings to speak of. It's, it's possible that we can gain a very, very small amount of nutrition from fiber, and that's only due to the activity of some putrefying bacteria that exist in our colons that are able to ferment a very, very small amount of the fiber that uh, we eat. Uh, relative to the amount of fiber that most people do eat, actually. Uh, That produces some short-chain fatty acids and a few other things, um, none of which we cannot derive from other sources. It is not required whatsoever. Uh, It is not also required for bowel function. Carnivores, in general, have the best bowel function of their lives. Once fully adapted to the carnivore diet, over a 20 plus or minus six-week period, Uh, not 20 plus or minus six minutes or even days for a full adaptation, by the way. It's about six months to do it properly, slowly and progressively. You should never change your diet rapidly overnight. That'll upset your microbiome. Any carnivores that are experiencing gut issues in their first couple of years, actually, it's probably due to a microbiome issue. It's not due to the carnivore diet. Um, I have excellent bowel function. One and done, lay a rope, not even cut into stanzas usually, uh, every morning or every other morning, often. No problems whatsoever. Brilliant stuff. Awesome. Okay, so no, fiber, not an essential, essential nutrient. A vitamin K, she says. No, we're not short on vitamin K in a carnivore diet. There's plenty. What's next? K, okay. they're primarily from uh, plant sources. Plant sources. So is vitamin C primarily from plant sources. That doesn't mean it's the only source of it. Vitamin K does, in fact, exist in meats uh, and uh, fat-soluble fat soluble, uh, micronutrient. And again, there's plenty of it to be found in the meat because we're not all falling over from vitamin K deficiency. In fact, we're enjoying rude and radiant health, we carnivores, uh, unlike others who perhaps might be showing some pretty obvious overt signs of really, really very, very serious metabolic dysfunction. Perhaps, Emma, I don't know uh, whether that's happening or not anywhere out there in the marketplace. Um, I I actually do because I've had a good look around. Um, hmm. What are the possible negative consequences of lacking those things in your diet? Vitamin C is really important for preventing things like scurvy. We covered that in in the earlier introductory bit. 
No. Yeah. Um, mm, so the old, <laughs> the old illness that sailors used to get from not being able to eat any fresh fruit, where your gums start bleeding, old scars start opening up, you can't heal wounds properly. That's not a very. I mean, I mean, really, honestly, here, University of Newcastle, would you not put somebody up on their hind legs to do this presentation to the Australian public who will inspire confidence in the Australian public in some way? Who will actually say something remotely sensible and who will, um, in so doing, look the part. If you get my drift. A pleasant way to live. Sounds Five like a really zombie important. film. Yeah, it, it, re- it really eat all meat and, and get scurvy. Yeah, that does sound like a zombie That is just absolutely, utterly ridiculous from start to finish, isn't it, kiddies? Wow. I'd laugh if it was funny. Zombie film. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and fiber is really important for our gut health. So our yeah, no, it isn't actually. If anything, um, there is only one even remotely pseudo clinical study extant anywhere in the literature that can inform on that topic, and its results are absolutely unequivocal. Actually, what you should do, Emma, is do a search on your fellow Australian doctor, Paul Mason and fiber and you will find a youtube video that he made where he is outlining and referring to a study the study i'm referring to the only one that's even remotely of a sort of clinical observational uh, or remotely experimental nature around bowel function and fiber and you'll see that the results of that study are absolutely unequivocal and you know, if anything, the inference there, N equals 68, is that fibre is absolutely disastrous for bowel function. And its withdrawal, dose response, is associated with remission of symptomology of bowel dysfunction. Oops. Okay, what's next? A gut bacteria actually make some of the nutrients that we use in our body? Yes but they don't need to because we can get those nutrients from elsewhere. As well as um, providing a lot of important signalling molecules that do things like tell us that we're full um, or do things like... Do they, Emma? I get pretty good signalling from my meat-only diet as to when I'm full and I therefore stop eating. Um, Others might not, perhaps, I don't know, be in the same boat of people who have good signals going to their brains telling them to stop eating, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Like uh, help us regulate our blood sugar um, and our... uh... Yeah, blood sugar, yep, yep, you'll find that my blood sugar is absolutely rock solid at a really, really great level. My A1C you'd find to be, you know, absolutely in the ideal range. Um, I wonder, Emma, if we had a look at yours, whether or not we'd find the same on either of those things. Um, our appetite, desire for eating. Yeah, yeah. tell us more about that, Emma. Vitamin K is a little bit trickier um, in terms of what it does. It definitely is an essential nutrient, but it has a bit more, um, less obvious, I guess, consequences in terms of a deficiency. Um, But what I would say is that when you're thinking about deficiencies and the things you're missing, uh, not all these things manifest immediately. The body's really good at what we call homeostasis. And homeostasis is keeping things in the normal situation. Yes. There's also... A, a strain of argument from uh, pro- proponents of the carnivore diet, basically that nutrition science is has kind of got it all wrong. There's like a big misunderstanding. It's not a misunderstanding at all. It's anti-scientific propaganda, spin doctory, smoke and mirrors and evangelization of the world to suit the bottom right-hand corner of a number of self-claimed authorities. There's no misunderstanding here. They're doing it with malice of forethought. This is an evil um, conspiracy being perpetuated against the health of human beings, isn't it, uh, Emma?
Um, and there's like an orthodoxy that, uh, that, that doesn't take account of new information that's emerging and that they're kind of at the forefront of that. It's not new information. Human beings have been eating a almost entirely carnivorous diet now for at least four and a half million years in our current speciation and in those species immediately predecessing human beings as well. It's not a new thing at all, actually. Now, obviously, that's a pretty big thing to debunk, but um, what, do you, what do you say to that? Well, I think every conspiracy theory starts with the idea that the experts have got it wrong. Yes, the experts, Emma, absolutely. Tell us, tell us all about your expertise in health and knowing all about what's good for a human being nutritionally, Emma, because you're really, really very, very credible in that regard, aren't you? Goodness gracious, goodness gracious. All you have to do, though, is say the word conspiracy theory, and that in itself is supposed to be a debunkment because it invokes negative feelings and reactions in people. Oh, conspiracy theorist, we don't want anything to do with that. Trust the science is what we need to do. Well, Emma, I'm a scientist. I've been a scientist for about 27 years now. And um, I can tell you that one of the things I learned about science in that time is that questioning the science is how you fucking do science. That's what doing science is, Emma. Okay. Anyway, though, get get back to your well, you get back to your little chat about how how it is that you're an expert in health and the nutritional needs for human beings. Obviously, um, by the way, expert. Uh, uh, break down the word expert. You'll find that one interesting. X is an unknown quantity, and a spurt is a drip under pressure. Emma. Okay. Wrong, and haven't done the research or have some vested interests. But, they have done the research, they do have a vested interest, and as such, they are misguiding the public on a grand scale in order to subserve their bottom right-hand corner, among other things. Um, the whole area of human nutrition science is actually a ring-fenced area of ideology, theology, bastardization of science, and... Um, it's a dirty cesspit, basically, of anti-scientific crack pottery, charlatanism, Dunning-Kruger, and, and a bunch of other problems as well. But really, I think that comes from a misunderstanding of what nutrition science is. No, it doesn't. Not at all. So people think that there needs to be a, a randomised control trial. And in there does, if you want to talk about cause and effect, Emma. Those are the disciplines of science. Those are the requirements. Those are the rules. I don't make the rules. The rules of science were set about 2,000 years ago or formalised most, uh, most you know, earliest that we can find a formalisation of it was about 2,000 years ago, give or take, depending on, you know, which sources you, you want to read on that topic. This is not a new thing. I didn't make it up. I'm not making the rules. If you want to assert cause and effect, you do have to do a randomized, double-blind, placebo crossover trial, which does need to be properly designed, properly disciplined, properly randomized in the first instance, properly powered, properly tenured, metabolic ward lock-in in nature, or proper observation and control. All sorts of things like that. Otherwise, you don't have science and you cannot assert cause and effect or make a cause and effect inference. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that you don't like that and want to suggest that something other than that is true. It isn't. What's next? Intervention, where we compare people on one diet to people on another diet. To Identically genetically identical people, that is, otherwise you haven't controlled adequately because you don't have two populations that are identical at the outset. You also need to separate them at birth and lock them at labs at birth 
give them all the exact same life experiences and inputs and outputs so as not to have any confounds existing before the beginning of your experimental protocol. Good luck getting the ethics, getting the practicalities together, getting the finance to do that. It'll never happen. Forget about it, Emma. You're kidding yourself. And you're kidding yourself in that you think remotely that what you're saying will fool anybody with more than about three brain cells, because it won't. Okay? To know what is, is a healthy diet to recommend for people. Correct. You do need all of those things to know what is a healthy diet, because a healthy diet is one of those cause and effect inferences, isn't it? Yes, it is. So you need an experiment. Do you have one, Emma? If so, how did you get the ethics for that? Goodness me. People. Uh, but that's actually a very impractical, high cost, unethical, um, and almost impossible way. Absolutely impossible, not almost. Way of doing things. Doing things if you want to assert cause and effect about hard health outcomes in human beings as a factor of any aspect of nutrition in those human beings. The fact that it's impractical, impossible, unethical, out of reach, doesn't mean it's okay to go right ahead, throw the disciplines of science out completely, and say, fuck it, we're going to make cause and effect inferences anyway, even though we do not have the data to underpin those inferences. We're going to lead people up the garden path, and we're going to basically give people guidelines on their nutrition on the basis of our theory, our hypothesis. Because that is all you've got, Emma. Absolutely, utterly unacceptable behavior from start to finish. It leads people to make really bad choices about their nutrition and you know all sorts of things can occur to people who make bad choices nutrition-wise, can't they, Emma? Fuck me. This is unbelievable. What's next? Because we can't randomize people into those diets for a very long-term study. So we don't make decisions in nutrition off the back of single studies or... Or any studies at all, in fact, because there aren't any. Or, or segregating people into different groups. We make decisions based on the body of evidence. There isn't a body of evidence. That's my whole point. It does not exist. A large amount of evidence, a great number of studies. So we don't typically... A great number of studies, no. There are no studies, by which I mean experimental works that can inform on cause and effect as regards any aspect of heart health outcome in human beings over any period of time as that relates to any aspect of nutrition whatsoever. None. Zero. Nil poire. Pop yourself directly to fuck. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Okay? Probably move yourself around the block a few times before you go to, you know, before you go to jail, go around the block a few times, I'd say, Emma, perhaps. Typically study people on the carnivore diet because that would be unethical because we know from the body of evidence that we have all... There is no body of evidence. ...that putting people on a, a carnivore diet could do them harm. So No. See, that's the great thing about the word could. It leaves the other thing entirely on the table. Maybe it won't. I'm over seven years in. I'm still waiting for a problem. Kelly Hogan, 12 years. She's still waiting for a pro, uh, problem. I, I know of at least one individual who is, you know, in their 23rd or 24th year, I think now, of 100% carnivore, still waiting for a problem. How long do we need to wait, Emma, for a problem? I don't know. You tell me. You're the one, you're the one that's an expert in nutrition, clearly, obviously. Scurvy, though. Fiber stuff and body of evidence mm. well the only body of evidence i've seen in this uh, video emma leads me to suggest that that body 
is evidence that uh, that the person concerned is probably not a great uh, a great authority on evidence or bodies or nutrition or health or anything remotely connected with that. Okay. Sorry about that. Facts though. Would be unethical for us to do that study. That's it. Wow. Incredible. Absolutely, utterly incredible. By which I mean totally lacking in credibility. ABC, the Australian Broadcasting uh, Commission, give yourself about 700 uppercuts. Get a clue. Get your act together. That was absolutely fucking appalling. Um, I've seen a lot of absolute drivel and garbage in my time. And that's right up there, folks. Hope you enjoyed this little uh, journey down Cuckoo Lane with the insane, the mad, rambling, um, absolutely cognitively dissonant Dunning-Kruger sufferers of the world who think remotely that that was worth their worth their while. Um, just, just unbelievable. Anyway, you know the drill. Join me next time when someone else will be wrong on the interwebs. Don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. And uh, music, if you don't mind. Three, two, one.